We have four people who are going to give the keynote, which is why we have four chairs up here. All right, uh, just to be on time, we're going to get started. Unfortunately, we've lost our keynote speaker for, uh, from tomorrow morning. Uh, so instead, what we are planning to do is we're planning to move uh, Aslak's keynote from today evening to tomorrow morning. So Aslak will do his keynote tomorrow morning. Uh, thanks for adjusting to that. And now what we are planning to do is a uh, bunch of you have answered the question that was asked, why Agile sucks and why it won't work in the company. We've collated those. We've kind of tried to prioritize some of those questions we thought are important questions that we want to discuss. So Rakesh is going to help me uh, read out those questions. And then we're going to try and get a few speakers, a few people from the audience to come and answer that question. And then every couple of questions will rotate so new people can come on stage. So this is you know, everyone kind of trying to pitch in and kind of answer those things. All right? Clarity will emerge as we go along. So, do you want to ask the first question and then people could come on stage? Hey, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Rakesh. I write software. It's occasionally good. Um, and uh, I hope you've been enjoying Agile so far. Um, it's very interesting. I, I missed the name of the person who suggested this format, by the way. But yeah. do you credit? I think we should uh, thank Anton. Anton, if you're around. So Anton suggested this. He's seen it at some other conference. We thought this is a pretty cool idea, so we're going to try this. All right. I've, we've got a bunch of questions uh, about why Agile sucks. I agree with almost every single one of them, just to be clear. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, I think I'm, I'll try to convince you that Agile sucks as well. Let's see if that works. Uh, let's start with the first question here, uh, just to get things rolling. And I found this, que this particular question very interesting because, because of the opening line here. It says, Agile deals with a lot of process. And that got me thinking right there. <laughs> you know, because this was what Agile was supposed to be against. Right? So anyway, Agile deals with a lot of process, which becomes an overhead over a period of time. Time spent uh, in, uh, in streamlining the process is more than the actual productive time, apparently. So that, I agree with this. I think that people just spend too much time on what they were out to battle in the first place, which, you know, what are your opinions about that? What do you think? Um, and I'm an agile practitioner. <laughs> yeah. um, I think you're right. Some of, some, of the, some of the consultants and some of the organizations selling training, they, you know, they have an agenda, and their agenda is to train people in a certain process, it could be Scrum, it can be Kanban, it can be XP, although nobody's doing XP anymore, uh, unfortunately. Um, but I think the problem, one of the things that you have to be aware of is that, you know, these are, pr these are practices, but many of them are practices that are taught outside of a context. Now, if you look at the, the Agile Manifesto, uh, that's more of a bunch of principles. So you have to if you, want to, if you want to succeed with Agile, you have to come up with your own practices, and, and those practices are dependent on the context. You'll find some, uh, some recommendations of, of good practices that might work in, uh, you know, in some scenarios, in some, in some settings, but ultimately what you should try to do is to come up with your own practices that try and solve your own problems depending on your own context. That sounds good. <laughs> Uh, I, I started with this stuff very uh, a long time ago in 2000 and I loved this agile stuff because it was so simple so simple compared to what I used to be doing it, it agile should be dead simple it should be sit down with your team plan some stuff to do this week do stuff get up every day talk about the stuff you worked on talk about what you're gonna work on today uh, and at the end of the week at the end of two weeks sit down look at what you finished and say how's that look what should we do next week that's it uh, I don't know how the formality uh, got into this stuff and it, it, it I guess it turns out simple is hard and simple takes a lot more instructions well it, it shouldn't shouldn't be that hard I'm gonna stop there good so that's a good stopping point 
My thinking is that the reason it's actually become hard and process heavy is probably a couple of things. One is that in order to do it the simple way, you need to change, you need to change some difficult things. And people actually prefer not to change those difficult things and they prefer to make the process heavier in order to support that. So they added a, a lot of things on top of it that make it maybe possible without changing too much. I think a lot of the things we're seeing around Scaling Angel these days are uh, taking that stance. And a lot of the problems are actually happening because we're trying to bring agility to um, bigger, uh, tougher uh, contexts where, where actually some process might be required. In parallel to that, we have a lot of people who don't remember those simple things, don't understand those simple uh, mindsets, and basically understand the, the practices. And when those people go and do Agile, um, they basically, that's what they know. And they don't know how to streamline the process, and if they are trying to streamline the process, they're not very fast in doing it to the point that they can kill out all of the overheads. So I think that's part of what uh, we're seeing, but I agree, it sucks. I, I completely agree with you, and one thing I'd like to point out is that agile process, whenever somebody mentions that, that, mentions that word or those two words, tell them that uh, that's an oxymoron. Because agile means to adapt to change. Now, how can you adapt to change if you have a process? The process is, is rigid. It tells you what to do when certain things happen. What if something changes? Well, then now you need to change the process. So that's being agile. So agile process, it's just, it's just ridiculous. But we have a meta-level process which deals with that change. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm going to try and request one uh, change. So we're going to go quickly. Let's make it more like a firing round kind of a format. So let's try and see. I know it's hard to kind of impromptu come up with something, but let's give it a shot. For the next question, we're going to try and do more of a firing round kind of a thing. So let's try and put something out very quick. And I do want someone from the audience to come and participate in this. I don't want this to be, uh, you know, I don't want it to be imbalanced by only you know a bunch of people sitting here. So I want everyone to come and participate. I want one chair here, which is empty, to be filled by one of the practitioners. There you go. All right. Do we have the next question? Firing round. Considering that you're saying we should kill the processes, I think I'm in love with you guys. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but I think it segues into the next question right here. It says. Uh, this, this dude or, or person saying that my team is not motivated uh, enough to adapt uh, fragile and takes them, uh, takes them time to get them adapted. Management is not ready and uh, uh, they expect results from day one as well when they're implementing stuff. So, uh, you know, this does not work is what this dude is saying. What are your thoughts? Actually, before we jump to that, uh, you don't have to agree with everything they're saying. If you disagree with something, you know, feel free to throw your hands up and, and, and uh, shout. That's cool. That's absolutely cool. All right. <laughs> All right. Sure. <laughs> it says the team is not mature enough to adapt. Uh, to adapt. I can't save this. I can't save this fragile or agile. But well, the team is not mature enough to adapt uh, agile and it takes time to get uh, adoption. Management is not uh, ready either, and, they, uh, and when they adapt it, they expect results from day one. Yeah, that sucks, <laughs> basically. But uh, my approach to that is to first start with the managers and make sure that they understand what they're going into, and they need to choose whether they want to evolve slowly towards Agile or do a revolution. If they're not ready, then don't go to the teams and do something with them. They don't have support. You got anything? Uh, I would say uh, I would prefer a course for the senior management. That's the first thing. Uh, not a CSM for us, but a CSM type of thing for the senior management. That is what I prescribe because the current CEOs, I don't see a course currently for the current CEOs and CTOs to understand as I at depth. That is one of the things which I personally feel. Secondly, uh, I would, I would, I would want a, 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 a big sprint zero there, 
if I if if I see a management there who is not uh, essentially uh, helping the team to uh, scale to that level, I would want to see a bigger sprint zero where, if, where I where I try to involve the senior management as well. So I strongly disagree. I think uh, out of all the senior management folks that I've met, I think they are really smart. They know what the heck they are doing. Uh, we kind of seem to put the blame uh, on senior management, saying that they don't know what the heck they are doing and they expect results from day one. So I disagree to that, that we need coaches for senior managers. I think uh, coaches are kind of oversold in some sense. I, I, I would disagree again because I, I see those rigid managers, it's very, very difficult for them to even uh, think of an, a process where they would not want a training. So I think that's in their DNA as a certification or a, uh, that is how they breathe and understand things. So to start with, I would still want a, a certification or something for them to make them at least come to those really. Well, I think another round of certification. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> More money. <laughs> I think we've got a very cr uh, crystal clear answer to this question at the first day of the conference, at the talk of uh, Diana Larson with this uh, gel fluency model. You remember these stars. So without investment, you will not get any uh, star rated uh, levels of fluency of agility. So no money, no results. Or no investment, no results. I like that certification thing. I want to take this opportunity to announce uh, my new certified scrum manager. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I think it's fair from now on to say, look, uh, I'm a certified scrum master, but hey, you're not a certified scrum manager. So uh, look, you've got to do what I say until you get certified. <laughs> that seems fair. What about the CEOs? Do we need another kind of CEO. certificate for them? <laughs> okay, that's not a good idea. <laughs> I, I agree with you, they know what they're doing usually too. All right, moving on. This question, well, I'll just read it out, all right? Point number one, big, big egos of management and product owners. <clears throat> Point number two, leadership team wants to blame juniors for everything instead of taking corrective actions. Point number three, business is not clear on what they want. In all caps, large bold letters, no requirements, is what it says here. Whoever this person is, I think you need to find a new job. It's just a hint. Maybe it's a toxic work environment, things like that. You know, just consider this. <laughs> yeah, but clearly, I mean, so I guess, I guess what this person is saying is that, is that there are problems like, you know, office politics and all of that stuff, which hinder the process, and then how do you deal with that, right? I guess it's outside the scope of Agile, but it's a real problem, isn't it? Yeah, I was, uh, all, uh, all I was about to say is I don't think Agile changed anything about that. Um, uh, that was probably true before Agile. Uh, uh, yeah, I can, as a rule, I can generally say if things uh, suck before Agile, they'll suck with Agile too. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, at least we talk, and you end up having to talk about how much it sucks more often with Agile. That's not a help, is it? <laughs> yeah, no requirements. This is actually in bold and underlined and stuff. So you're talking to the wrong person about no requirements. <laughs> uh, I've blown up multiple times at people who refer to things as requirements. I think it's your job to actually solve problems. I think it's your job to actually understand what you're building and who it's for and why. And if you've got no requirements, uh, get off your effing butt and go talk to somebody about who's, talk to somebody who's using the thing you're building and uh, try and understand why. Decide uh, what'll help them. Uh, the requirements are just other words we use for decisions we make to solve people's problems. So go help people. To take the more general perspective of if things suck and uh, sucked before Agile, they will continue to suck. I think your Agile sucks if it doesn't make things suck less. Um, that's, that's the whole point here. Um, 
Yeah, I just wanted to, I, I agree with what Jeff says about, you know, if there are no requirements, you should try and seek them out. I think it's useful to make a distinction between requirements and specifications. So I think of requirements as a, a need that a business has, you know, some capability that they need, but that they don't have, some problem that they need solving. And then a specification is a description of how you fulfill that requirement, um, which is a technical document. But you know, a, a requirement is, is really just something that you can understand and put in your head if you're talking to other people. I agree. Okay. And then you can write your own specification. You know, if they don't write it for you, well, that, that's that's great. That means you can you, you're free to implement it however you want. Uh, it's tough. I'm going to cite. Uh, it's an Alistair Coburnism that if it's your decision to make, it's design. If it's not your decision to make, it's a requirement. Um, uh, that's it. Uh, in any case, yeah, you're right. A business have needs, and we should be able to make the decisions about the details of those things, uh, which ends up being a specification. But uh, some people put themselves in different places on the line. And I realize in my, with, with the stuff I was just saying, look, if there are no requirements or there are nobody saying uh, uh, what the business's needs are, that that should be the product owner's responsibility and if they're not doing their job. But man, uh, roles, are, roles are hats, not heads. If no one's doing the job, put on the hat and, and jump up and do it. All right, thank you. That would be the agile thing to do. Even if it means that you're doing it without a clear understanding of the real business needs because nobody in the oh. business is there to What I'm advocating play with you? is uh, go out and find them. Then unless they're, you know, if they're hiding under their desks, uh, sneak, you know, smell them out. <laughs> yeah, and, and fail yeah. fast, right? Go out there and oh, fail fast. Oh, one of the, this, this is kind of what I'm going to talk about tomorrow and do my workshop on Sunday. But if, if if you don't have a clear understanding of requirements, one thing that you can do is to go to somebody who is a domain expert, somebody who, you know, I don't know, if you're making healthcare software, go and talk to a doctor or whatever and ask them to give you an example. Give me an example of how you would like your problem, of, of what kind of problems you have. Give me an example of how you would like this problem solved. Uh, and just keep asking for a bunch of examples and that will, that will give you a better understanding. So the challenge is if you go and ask a doctor in India, every doctor you speak to, they'll give a different <laughs> answer. And then you're building software for someone in the US, which is going to be completely out of sync. Yeah, but you have to do this anyway, right? You have to talk to the end users uh, if you're going to make something valuable. Because if you don't, then, uh, well, maybe you're lucky. Maybe you have a requirement specification, and you're going to end up you know, creating software that does exactly maybe what the, what the specifications say, but that's not what the users need. So you have to talk to them anyway. Yeah, so what I was trying to highlight is instead of sometimes talking, you might want to, you know, demonstrate something very quickly so they can, art, they can understand what you're actually talking about. Yeah. All right, let's jump to the next oh, one, sorry. Uh, one more thing, uh, this is a bit evil, um, but it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an efficient trick. Like if it's difficult for you to get an understanding of what it is that you're supposed to build, pretend you misunderstood it and, and say, oh, um, so when, you know, when a doctor files, uh, you know, creates, um, creates a new patient, then we should automatically send them uh, an ad to buy, I don't know, something. Just make something up and then they will tell you, no, 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 no that's not what's going to happen. And now they're going to start ac actually explaining it to you. I, I love the sentiment of this question. Uh, it says, Agile is another way of avoiding intellectual work. I, I, the opening lines are just beautiful in this. And I agree, if you can sort you, of... Can you please repeat that? I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes on to add, so Agile is another way of avoiding intellectual work uh, in, in terms of design. Waterfall was never about documents. It was about deep thinking. Uh, jumping into coding is the most loving thing anyone can do. I guess he means that people love jumping into coding. But who's to bear the cost of poor scalability? Uh, the customers don't have tolerance for mistakes. Waterfall has proved itself over the years. Uh, we don't need software every week. Uh, and stability is preferred over fragility. 
<laughs> well, so that's a question to you, whoever asked this. <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> I, I, I would have a short answer. I think it sucks that Scrum won over extreme programming, and it kind of explains the, that this even is a question. You got anything? I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the opening line. <laughs> it <laughs> says, Agile is a way of avoiding intellectual work. I don't even know what intellectual work is. I, I guess they're meaning that, you know, sitting down and planning up front rather than, right. uh, rather than, you know, just swinging it and taking, you know, one small thing at a time, right? So I hope you guys can answer the question so that whoever asked that goes convinced, <laughs> right? So the burden is on your shoulders now. It's, it boils down to, to ignorance, right? When are you the most ignorant in a project? Is it at the beginning of the project or is it at the end of the project? Usually, you're, you're the most ignorant when you start. And if you make all the decisions uh, at the time when, you're the, where, where you are the most ignorant, I think it's quite evident that you're going to make a lot of mistakes. Now, if you can make those, if you can defer most of those decisions uh, about the technology you choose, um, how many people you put on the project, what kind of features you implement, if you can defer those as you get more feedback, you will make more informed decisions. Um, and it's, it's a fallacy that you can, you know, to suggest that you can analyze a problem just by having enough time. You, you can't. You need feedback and you don't get feedback when you analyze. I'm going to pipe in and say that's, I don't know how Agile got so stupid. Um, uh, Look, when we started this, uh, again, I'll go back to what it was supposed to be. Make a list of the stuff you want to build. Start uh, a week or start a cycle by choosing stuff you want to build. Talk every day about what you got done yesterday and what you plan on doing today. At the end of the week, take stock of how much you've got done. Look back at your plan and decide how to go farther. That's all there is to it. Have the self-discipline to get stuff done. Now, nowhere did it say don't think, and nowhere did it say don't plan ahead. Uh, um, you know, I'm known for this story mapping thing, and I build big story maps that describe the whole application. I bring, app, uh, bring architects in, and we look, step back and look at it, and say, okay, well, what, is this, what are the architectural implications of this thing? Yeah, think big, but don't, don't, uh, don't wait to act. Don't wait to build something. Don't wait to, to experiment. Don't wait to try things. But now th there's a balance between taking months to think big and not doing anything and uh, jumping right in and doing something and not, uh, well, not, not thinking through to the end of things. I don't know if that makes sense. So I, 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 want, I was waiting for you to give that, and I wanted to build on top of that, is that I've seen a lot of projects where uh, People think Agile basically means that I'm going to go in and start writing code on day one, right? You don't have requirements, you don't have things. So maybe it's a misinterpretation, but I could argue, wearing the devil's advocate hat, I could argue that that is in spirit what the manifesto is all about, right? It is about people and interaction over processes and tools. So, you know, if jumping in and writing code and this is working for us, then that's what it is. Uh, so that might be a misinterpretation, but that's how people think it's Agile. I agree that that's a problem, and I think that it's a problem that most people read just the values and not the principles, and that most people, what I meant was, they're doing scrum, they're doing dailies, they're doing sprints, they're doing Kanban flow, but they're not doing the necessary engineering practices that enable you to move fast without planning too much upfront. If you're not doing the right engineering practices, then it will be expensive to change stuff when you figure out things later, and you will get bit by it. So it's either that you think a bit more upfront, think big in any case, uh, and implement maybe a bit some uh, infrastructure for it, or do the right engineering practices and have good automation, good refactoring, simple design, simple code, clean code, and then you can bear with the fact that you learn along the way. It's either of those two things, but you cannot play along without the good engineering practice. Um. Actually, I'm going to take a step back and tackle this question differently. I have done a lot of waterfall work, and I never felt I have done any intellectual work there also. 
So I really don't know what is this question coming from, <laughs> right? So if you think you are doing intellectual work, you are doing intellectual work, whether it is waterfall or agile or anything else. I mean, this question itself is, it sucks actually. The question itself is not intellectual. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now I have a different person. Now I have a different thing because we are trying to improvise ourselves. We change the code based on the based on the business requirements what we have. We design it every sprint. It's you try the DDD, then you, you can hear, see the change. So how difficult is that, and how intellectual things you have to adapt. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, continuing with the theme of great opening lines, uh, <laughs> this one goes: Ajax sucks because sorry, Agile uh, sucks because it's designed to suck. Because, because it's designed to suck. Agile sucks because Agile it's sucks. designed to suck. Is is it's yeah? It's, I, I think people like making impactful opening lines. It's just it must be from the politics of the country, I guess. Uh, so Agile sucks because it's designed to suck. It is designed to fail, fail early and fail often. For a lot of people, failure is not an option, and hence Agile sucks for these people. Now, I'll, I'll follow this on immediately with another question. I think it's in the same vein. It says, uh, this one is not in the theme of great opening lines, though, but it says, telecom operators still don't trust Agile, uh, Agile the Agile way of doing deliverables. They, uh, they don't want one bug to bring down their service. Rollback is possible, but the reputation is lost forever. We're going to stick to our current process, this person says. So I guess what they're saying is that, is that failure is not an option in certain cases, uh, and Agile clearly doesn't fit there, right? Absolutely. Fail spectacularly with one big bang release, <laughs> right? I, Fireworks. I, I, would, I don't understand how Agile, um, sorry, what was the question again? So um, the question is that, that certain, certain uh, tasks don't have room for failure, and uh, yeah. And Agile requires you to, uh, you know, to deliver stuff and iterate quickly, and that might so not fit. So the assumption is that if you if you're doing Agile, then you will have frequent failures. Agile is designed for frequent failure. <laughs> okay, I haven't heard that one before. That's Actually, I, I don't know. You do Agile to fail. That's not the idea. I don't think so. Nobody's going to do Agile because they want to fail. They are doing Agile because they want to succeed. But in the process, you may fail. It's better to fail faster. It's better to fail earlier. But it's a kind of, you know, twisting the tail and says, hey, you know, the tail is in the head and head is in the tail. And that's how I look at it. Yes, that, that's the point I want to tell. So when you know that one, it is going to be complex or you are about to get failed. So it all depends on that, what is the size of that particular iteration that you're going to take. If you take a small iteration, okay, and the fail that you are going to do is you know, very little. That is the minimum damage that you are doing this you know, whole cycle over there. So the kind of this is another you know, big product developments over there. There are many times you may have to do some experiments, right? So at that experiment side, if you can take that iteration, it's a week long iteration, or it could be like daily XP programming kind of it like. So these could help you to quickly come back with the results, okay, and the observations that would help you to, okay, what is that that learning that you brought it and that you can apply in the next coming iteration. So. And one another aspect is it's okay to fail in your dev environment or a test environment. We are not saying that you are going to fail in the production. And there's a huge difference. Uh, I'm gonna, two things. Um, did I say this already? Uh, a friend of mine, a guy named David Husband, uh, says the difference between failure and learning is how much money you spend to do it. Look, if I spend a couple weeks worth of team's time and what I deliver is crap, I can say, well, that was learning. But if I spend a couple years of team's time, I can't say that was learning with a straight face anymore. That's failure. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, thank David Husband. It's, it's his thing. Now, I, I was thinking to myself, gosh, what have I ever been involved with that could not fail? So let me tell, I'll be as concise as I can with a story. Uh, 
I coached a team at a U.S. bank called Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo survived the bad U.S. banking crisis, and in the process they bought up other banks. One of the banks they bought was Wachovia. And I was coaching a team that had to integrate all the data from Wachovia and replace all the systems in Wachovia. And the, the underlying project was to move all this data over. It couldn't fail. We had nine months to build this, and it's just a data integration project. It's just mapping tables. They said, look, this can't be an agile project. We've got to spend several months mapping tables. We've got to uh, build just uh, ETL stuff to, to extract stuff. We've got to then move it over. And well, the plan we built says uh, at month seven, we will begin testing this stuff. And we'll have months seven, eight, and nine to test and get it right. And we talked about it and said, hey, that's not good enough. We're going to try something different. We're going to start, and in 45 days, you are going to come together, the teams in San Francisco, in Minneapolis, in uh, North Carolina, and in India. Uh, we're going to bring one representative from every team. We're going to sit into a room. We're going to sit in a room, and we are going to run the whole data conversion in uh, 45 days from now, and we're going to see if it works. I said, well, we can't possibly do that. We can't get it all done. I said, well, it, what have you got to do? We've got to do customers, we've got to do transactions, we've got to do all the history, we've got to do every, uh, a long list of things. And we said, well, just do the customers. Move the customers from all Wachovia systems into well systems in 45 days and show up and do it. So, okay, that's not the best way, but let's do it. We'll do it. They worked. At the end of 45 days, they showed up uh, under duress. They said, we've been talking with each other. This is going to work fine. We're going to show up uh, on Monday, we're going to do this, we're going to be out by lunch. Two days later, they get the code working, and it works. There's lots of problems, and all the conversation they had had and all the other testing they had done uh, failed. They weren't allowed to leave the room until they had it working. And they said, wow, this is great. We've got to keep doing this. And every 45 days, they met, and every 45 days, things got, uh, got bigger and bigger. They discovered lots of stuff along the way, and it went off smoothly, perfect, first time. And so for me, that's what the Agile stuff means. And it's not fail, I don't know if it's fail safe or fail often, or it's just try the crap until you're very, very confident that it works. That, that's it. So um, being in the services industry, uh, so what I've seen is uh, one of the problem is how the entire contract is written. So most of the times I've seen that the contract that our Agile being a buzzword, right? Our sales guys go there and sell it to the end customer. And, but then the contract is actually written in a waterfall manner. And, but when it comes to the implementation, we'll have to adopt Agile. So that's where the challenge comes in terms of how do you really deliver something in Agile when the contract is actually written in and with an outcome based or a milestone based. And that's where it actually falls into the uh, trap of failure. So I think uh, while we can definitely adopt or adapt to Agile, it's also how you actually write the contract and how you educate the client, okay, how Agile works. And it's all about incremental delivery that you get out of uh, Agile. And not like you will have to, you can expect that you you will, uh, you will give a design document and all those stuff that was there prevalent during the waterfall days. And uh, there was one more question about telecom operators not adopting to Agile. I completely differ to that. Because I have been associated with delivering uh, digital applications for large scale telecom operators, most of the geographies, and all of them were in Agile and all of them went successful. In that case, considering that they have a requirement of uptime and you know all of those things that they don't want to look bad, they don't want to fail in front of an audience, how do you deal with that then in, in a scenario like that? Well, I mean, that has nothing to do with actually Agile, right? Because, I mean, the, whatever you're saying, that can even happen for an application that has been deployed following a waterfall. I mean, that has nothing to link with Agile, actually, because the application is an application. It's a software. It can always get into bugs. I would like to add to that. Let's say we use Jeff's uh, example. And if every 45 days, what we should do is run the non-functional testing and you know, reduce the risk that we're uh, hitting uh, performance bags or something in, in production. I would like to add to or provide a 
different perspective on the contract side. I agree that if you're able to change your contracts, your service contract to be an agile, uh, incremental, iterative uh, contract, that would be ideal. But I think, and I've seen from experience uh, with multiple uh, clients, that even internal agile, agile that you do within a waterfall after the contract has been signed, even a fixed price contract, and where your delivery to UAT at the end is one delivery. The customer doesn't want to run multiple UATs, only wants one time to production. Even within that scenario, you can gain a lot of benefit by running Agile and internal feedbacks and running cycle between your development and testing and having working potentially shippable software along the way, ideally doing demos, maybe not stop to production, but even without those things, Every step that you take to reduce the risk of something blowing up at the end is something that you benefit from. It might look um, strange on your budgeting side. It might look like um, when you're running development, it costs more because you're running those iterations and you're not uh, saving money. But when time comes to integrate and to test and to prepare for the actual production, you probably save those that money. That has been my experience. So it's, oops, this is a really strong microphone. Um, it, it takes a long time. I'm, I'm from Norway, and the, the Agile movement in Norway started about 10 years ago. And after about six, seven years, um, the government actually started getting interested and changed their, their, their contract templates for, um, you know, because there's, the, um, if there is a government project uh, or a public sector project, you can't, uh, it has to be, there has to be a bidding process. So you have to have some sort of, some sort of scope and then various companies can bid on it. Um, but that's just a bidding process. What they did was to change the actual contract. Once they selected a vendor, they would have a much more relaxed contract than what they used to have. And and I think it, it will take a long time before that happens in, in, you know, in, any, in any place where Agile is, is new. Um, because what, what's the reason why, why customers are doing this? They want to protect themselves, right? It's, it's risky to run an IT project. So they try to, to cover themselves by, by putting in place a contract that says, if you don't deliver, um, we don't pay anything. But that's still very risky, right? Because even though the company or the organization isn't paying anything for the software, they're not getting the software either. So they're only really you know, mitigating half of the risk. And it's when they realize that actually if we can relax uh, the terms of the contract, we're actually, uh, maybe we're taking on some more financial risk, but we, we're lowering the risk that we, we're not getting at least some software for our money. So it, it's just, you just have to work with these people, right? Uh, it takes time. Uh, I would say uh, you don't design quality in a system. Uh, quality is something which is relative in nature. Right? And when you say you're designing something, you're designing actually a process. It's a mindset. Design is a mindset. Uh, I would like to just relate it to like you're cycling on a mountain, mountain, right? You cannot plan and decide where the pitfalls will come. So to me, it's more important to breathe fast and breathe slow by the cycling. You need to ensure what and when you need to change. And secondly, designing can only be adapted and prescribed that you have a static user base. Today, with the dynamic nature and digitization of work coming into picture, you will never have that. So saying that it is designed, first of all, it is not designed. It's a self-evolving model, I would say. You can add more and more to the umbrella to it. So it's not a design. It's something which is self-evolved. So yesterday's technologies have not obsolete. Today, something is there, which will be there. And then it will be further uh, revamped. So to me, it's a mindset. It's not a design. And we may say it's an it's a, it's a evolving thing. It's not a design. Thank you. I think w we would like to move to the next question. Is that okay? I think that we have a lot more questions and about three minutes left. Oh, that's it? All right. So, uh, all right. Uh, this one says, our company delivers software at fixed times of the year. How can we follow Agile when scope is adjusted as per the time left? I'm not sure I understand this question fully, but... I, I think I don't, I don't understand what they mean by Agile, but this is ag as Agile as I would get in that context. This is agile enough for me, right? If, if I can only deliver once a year uh, and then my scope gets adjusted based on what is accomplished, that's brilliant. 
And that's right. surprisingly common when it comes to end of financial year, because budgets are based on financial year, so you try and finish whatever work you can by 30 June or whenever it is. So you can use everything that's agile. You just, you have a fixed 12 iterations and then you're finished. It is. That's All right. Agile. <laughs> All right. Uh, this one sounds like a statement of fact, so I'm just going to read this and move on because it's a statement of fact, right? It says, I don't want anyone to track me when I know that, and my lead knows what I'm doing. It sounds like a statement of fact, so I'm just going to say, all right, that sounds fair. <laughs> Actually, um, in some countries it's illegal. In some countries you can't track people uh, in any granularity less than half a day. So um, just, just be aware when you are working in a, in a geographic distributed, sometimes your Kanban boards are problematic. Uh, from memory, uh, uh, the German, I think it's the, some of the German countries. Yeah, the German, I mean, you can't really track. You're not going there. <laughs> <laughs> some American three-letter company, no, never mind. Uh, <laughs> Scrum sucks because sizing and uh, estimation used to be very abstract, hence, uh, hence affecting productivity significantly. Statement yeah, of fact. Sounds fair to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, it's always hard to estimate anything. I mean, that's the reason its word is called estimate, right? There's always a variance to it. So Otherwise, it would be called an actual. Sorry? Otherwise, it would be called an actual. Yeah, that would be an actual otherwise. Where's Osco, author of No Estimation? He's going to come tomorrow, <laughs> okay. So whoever asked that question, please hold on till tomorrow. Till then, it's a, it's a fact. <laughs> um, all right, legacy products still require classic controls. I can't let a young bunch of college grads to violate the architecture, okay? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I guess there is Sorry. some, there's some, tr there's some point that they're trying to make, but I can't catch it, and we're sort of running low on time, so we'll have to skip ahead. But if there's, if there's something you need to add, sure. If, if you, I'll take to... passion over skill. Skill can be learned, but if I can hire someone straight out of university who has a passion and a love for what they do, then I'll take them over someone with two, three, four years' experience any day. Yeah, that makes sense. But you can't let them break your, violate your architecture. <laughs> 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 it's learning, isn't it? Passion is one side, architecture and violation is another side. <laughs> That's not allowed. <laughs> All right, last question. All right. This is a long one, but I'm going to try anyway. <laughs> business so you can is... stop after you're done with the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess I'll stop halfway through or something. Uh, business is, is, uh, is, is written requirements in, is, is, writing re is writing requirements in the legacy way. Business analysts are then converting these to user stories. Stories are then divided into sprints. Uh, release is based on, uh, for release and then based on dependency, blah, blah, blah. Uh, trace matrix is maintained in ALM. So it's combination, so this is all a combination of Agile plus V model. Uh, uh, and uh, it's just additional work for teams and, and uh, uh, quality is sacrificed uh, because of, uh, of lack of time at the end of the sprint. It's an hour. <laughs> Where's the question? <laughs> so it's a statement, is, okay, of fact. statement of fact. <laughs> this is why Agile sucks, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, a, a bastardization of taking a, I a guess traditional the, uh, process and trying to ram Agile into an yeah. solely at, a solely IT function without considering all the interfaces. Yeah. I mean, going by going by the stuff that they've mentioned here, it, it looks like they're talking about. The, the processes that seem to be associated with Agile all the time. So right? one of the things that we've done with a couple of my clients is uh, we've trained the customer first. If the customer can ask for Agile, then you're nine-tenths of the way to getting the rest of the IT or the rest of the software function to actually start to adopt those Agile practices. Okay, if the customer can't ask for Agile through not even necessarily user stories, but the ability to understand change and adaptability, then you really aren't going to be able to be Agile, you can't be Agile. You might do Agile, but you're not going to be Agile. Yeah, from the question, uh, what the sense that I get is the, the company used Waterfall, and uh, they have retained the framework of Waterfall and fitted some Agile elements onto the Waterfall. So that's why the V model and the terms like this coming in. And then they call that as Ajay. <coughs> so 
so that's where the problem is so if you want to really follow a child you, you may want to remove your whole waterfall boundaries that you play with otherwise these questions will come and they and they call this as an agile and say hey this is the same thing but it's not working but you're not moved away from the waterfall in the first place i know we're at the tail end and we've got to close it off but i uh, was talking to rush i've worked in i've spent a little bit of time with a few companies in india and i've seen evidence that people come in and really ram some bad agile down people's throats and i know that there are a lot of people suffering because they get really terrible agile coaches in they get taught really dogmatic forms of agile and if you're feeling like agile is really really sucking uh the best advice i have for you is to don't listen to the coaches do your own research do your own digging learn how it really is supposed to work and fight back <laughs> so um, it, it is supposed to make things easier and, and make things better. And if it's not, eh, don't do it. And if nothing works, find another company. There are a lot of good companies out yeah, there. If you, that's the old adage. If you can't change your company, change your company. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> so I want to jump on that one. That's under the belt. <laughs> you, you wanna... Talk about that in the mic. <laughs> we want to put you on the that, spot. That's all right. <laughs> we want to close it off. Yeah, Agile's not clearly defined. <laughs> that's it. It was never meant to be clearly defined, so it could be misused or it could be well used. So it's up to people. That's right. And actually, the, the people you've got to really fear are the ones that clearly define it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and also, if you see someone that talk to you and says that Agile sucks, or maybe you see some bad Agile, just bring the Agile manifesto and show the person and ask, where, where is the sucking part? <laughs> All over the place. <laughs> Because it's not clearly defined. <laughs> well, also, there's nothing common about common sense. So when an organization is going to be adopting Agile, I'll, you have to be pragmatic about it. There are processes, there are principles and values. These are things that need to be considered, but at the same time, common sense as to how your organization is going to work. All right. Thanks, Evan. Hopefully you guys uh, got some answers, you got some entertainment tonight, <laughs> right? Uh, next what we're going to do is we're going to try and uh, jump in and do a quick uh, round of introduction to uh, three companies who are participating in today's job fair. Uh, but before that I would like to thank uh, all the volunteers who helped us today. I know a lot of people have uh, stepped up and volunteered without being asked to and we really appreciate that so I thank you for jumping in and uh, lending a help, helping hand. So we're going to meet tomorrow 9 a.m. for uh, a Slack's keynote and uh, I'm going to quickly talk about the job fair. I know quite a few new faces are here so I'm going to quickly introduce the, the reason for the job fair and then I'm going to invite the companies to quickly uh, introduce themselves. So a couple of years ago when we were running these conferences, we had a lot of companies come in and ask us. I mean, so it's, it's absolutely fine if you want to leave. I don't want to hold up people. We are going to cut over into the job fair and I, you know, I want to introduce the, the idea of job fair and then cut over. So if you feel you want to leave, that's perfectly fine. Use the law of two feet, right? Uh, so just giving you a quick background about the need for the job fair or what problem we are trying to solve. Uh, companies want to find really good, passionate people, really good, skilled people. Agile or not is secondary. Uh, but they really want good people. And they feel that here in this audience, uh, they would be able, their likelihood of finding people who 
uh, suit their requirements in terms of being uh, you know, good is very likely and which is why they want to come here and talk to people. But trying to do that during the conference seems a little bit of uh, conflict of interest uh, with what the conference is about. It's about networking, it's not really about hiring. So, but then there is this need and we as Agile India, uh, you know, need to help companies find, you know, find, to, uh, find a way to solve that problem. Uh, also for the practitioners, I think a lot of times they find it hard to try to bring about the change they want in their companies and you know, they come to these conferences to find uh, other interesting places. So I think that's, that's where it is and uh, as Agile India, we want to create a platform to enable that uh, you know, meeting of two ends or meeting of the needs. So that's kind of a quick background about why an Agile job fair. And uh, we've, we've done one day before yesterday and we're gonna do another one today. So basically what's gonna happen next is we have three companies who are participating in the job fair. They're gonna do a quick five minute introduction about themselves and then they're available outside. So whoever's interested to know more details could please uh, go visit them and get details and interact with them. All right, make sense? So can we have uh, JP Morgan here please? Thank you so much Naresh. And uh, good evening, good evening, everybody. My name is Rivalino D'Souza, and uh, I'm, a part of the, I'm a part of the human resources function at JP Morgan. I've been with the bank for over five years now. I've been here since the last three days, and Naresh, thank you so much. I think it's been absolutely eventful, so much of information. I've thoroughly had, I've thoroughly had a good time. So uh, we did the session on Monday, and we did talk about JP Morgan, but today I want to do something a little different, and uh, touch upon some other, other aspects of JP Morgan. So JP Morgan as an organization has grown over the years and we continue to grow. But during one of our retrospective sessions, we identified one key area that we thought is important that we want to see as a change in the next iteration. And you, you won't believe what is that. I mean, I, I keep hearing this in corridors and I, I hear a few people who come to our booth and ask us this question, what is JP Morgan doing here? Are we here just to pick talent? Yes, I would not disagree. Yes, we are here to pick talent, but, but, that, the, uh, but the, the reflection session that we did, what came out from there? Everybody knows JP Morgan as three offices in India, one of the largest investment banks, yes. But how large are we from a technology perspective is something that we want to drive. We want to call it loud and clear, Yes, we are a technology shop, a solid technology shop where many technologies want to work. And we have the best, the best of stuff, and, and I'm going to call up somebody today who's going to talk about his experience, one of our techies, and is going to take us through his experience with the bank. And what are the kind of stuff you can expect if you join JP Morgan as a bank? So yes, number one thing that we want to drive, and the reason we've actually participated here, is to call out loud and clear that we are a technology shop. We've had a, quite a few of our senior directors who've also attended this conference and who've also given us feedback that there has been some amazing stuff that they've been able to pick up from this conference. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, before I call in my colleague and one of our techies to talk about, I just want to show you a few stuff and why I say we are such a large technology organization. So 58,000 number of servers managed by infrastructure engineers connecting our employees around the globe. That's the strength of our technology base across the globe. And in India, of this 30,000, we are close to around 8,500 to 9,000 technologists. Yeah, so 30,000 across the globe, of which 8,500 to 9,000 technologists in India, which is, which is huge. The amount that we spend on technology consumption is huge. It's, it's in billions. 7,200 applications developed and enhanced by our software developers to improve client experiences. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a few facts that I want to bring about and call out here in this, co in this conference today to give you an idea in terms of how large we as an organization. So without further ado, let me take this opportunity to call on top Jay Sima, one of our techies who will probably talk about his experience as a technologist. We do have presences and all of that, but as a technologist, you can hear it from the techie himself. Hey, thank you. So um, my name is Jaisima. I'm with uh, JP Morgan for the past four years now. Um, I've played uh, roles like Scrum Master, running the past Project Manager, and various other things. So I just want to touch upon two things here. One is uh, 
what it is to be a technologist in JP Morgan, right? So that's a question probably a lot of you would have. Um, being a global firm, we have offices across, um, so you, you'd be part of typically a global um, business group, which could be based out of Asia Pacific, Europe, or even Americas. So in, in addition to that, we are, the firm has moved a, a you know, lot of steps ahead in ensuring that we are, we are Scrum, we're following Scrum. And uh, so you'll have a local team which is basically trying to do um, uh, work on the backlogs, which is be pretty much local to an area where it could be Bangalore, Mumbai, or even Hyderabad. And there are scrum masters who are working with you. This is a local team, and you're, you have the ownership to um, you know, uh, convert those or uh, convert those backlogs into you know, the software which, which you should be proud of. The second thing is uh, being a part of a global firm, you will get a global backing, right, in terms of investments uh, into some technologies, and you name it, we have all kinds of technologies. It could be an ETL, it could be Java, it could be .NET, I think being such a big bank, it's expected to be in all technological areas. Um, so provide, with, with the global backing, you also have a local ownership that is, that is being evolved. And I'm saying uh, it's not that we have already emerged into a big agile player, but that's what the firm is looking at. And we have embarked on this journey from the past uh, two years, and I'm proud to say most of the projects are now on agile, and it's, 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 the firm has understands that this is the way to go. So with all this, I'm sure this should be an exciting place for you. Um, we are there in the booth. Any questions, you can come and talk to us. Thank you so much. So you've heard it from the techie himself, and uh, any questions related to technology or anything, you can, we're, we're definitely at the booth. I just want to cover one more thing. Obviously, with all our technologists, we have a very strong people agenda. Number one, mobility. Last year, we closed 2,200 roles across to, in, in the technology space, of which 25% was mobility. And when I mean mobility, I mean internal movement. So that's how much we promote our employees within the firm. Number one, uh, number two, diversity, high on agenda. Uh, we, we recently did uh, a diversity drive on the 8th of March for women, and uh, we, we, we invited over 1,600 applicants who came into the organization, and uh, we've had an amazing, amazing footfall and an amazing conversion there. So we're very high on a people agenda as well. So ladies and gentlemen, I think a very, very good organization to be a part of, and even if you have any questions in terms of the work we do, we not only have Jaisama, but we have quite a few of our other technologists who will be there at the booth and will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I think the most interesting thing for me was just, you know, how much JP Morgan believes that this is actually going to help them, and they, they've been seeing the benefits of it. I think that goes a long way to say that Agile is actually making pretty good inroads, and that's, that's very promising to hear. Thank you. Thanks. Can I invite someone from QAI, please? Um, my name is Pradeep. I represent QAI in the audience today, and I represent the North American region for QAI. Uh, just let me give you a quick summary of what QAI is in a very simple nutshell. We are a 30-year-old firm. Our main bases of operation are India, China, Singapore, and US. We have 300 client journeys that we have completed in the 30 years. And we are a team of 180 members in, a, in India, 75 in the US. And what we are here is to primarily say that we are recruiting as well. So that's high, primarily the goal. To tell you what it is like at QAI, I prefer to tell you a story of one of our employees. You know, that's something that you can relate to probably. 14 years back, a gentleman called Aditya Bala graduated from IIT Delhi, wanted to work as a change agent for some of the clients. Was working as a business development professional in Microland, comes over to us, joins us, starts working in the business process improvement practice. 14 years later, you know, he's one of the master trees facilitator for government of Singapore, helping them improve their transactional excellence using lean, Kanban, and Six Sigma methodologies. Now that's just a profile of a person that we are looking for. So what we are looking for is the next Aditya in the room. Okay, if you are that Aditya, certainly you can come over to the booth and talk to us. 
But more importantly, the culture that we follow is something that differentiates us. And so I don't need to sell it, but I'll just probably play a few slides that kind of define what we believe in. Wow. Okay. Right? I just want you to spend it two seconds in each slide and read the kind of feelings that we have about what we think. So that's what it is. Okay. So if you think you believe in those statements, and if you think that you want to put a ding in the universe, we are outside at the booth to talk to us, and we would love to get to know you better. Thank you. <laughs>